In The Godfather 2, Michael Corleone was put in an impossible situation where his former capo regime, Frank Pentangeli, was going to appear before the Senate as a direct witness against him. At this time, Michael was working on removing the criminal reputation that surrounded the Corleone family so he could rebrand it as one of America's most powerful dynasties. But this ambition blinded Michael from what was really going on. Following the masterful plot orchestrated by Hyman Roth, Michael was now at risk of losing everything as Roth was able to make Pentangeli appear before the Senate without realizing that Roth was the one actually pulling the strings. This would mean the undisputed end of the Corleone family. But just before it seemed his fate was sealed, Michael achieves the impossible. One of the most brilliant things about the Godfather trilogy is the fact that it's jam-packed with hidden gems that, all these years later, not only hold up, but they give us some insight into how those in the game of power think and rise to the top. It's the exploration of a ruthless world that most people have zero access to. So today, we'll be unveiling the mysterious origins of Frankie Five Angels, his dispute with the Rosado brothers, the secret that ties in all the missing pieces you've never realized existed, and perhaps more importantly, how this masterclass in the game of power relates to our real world, and perhaps how it can help you in your own life. Understanding these concepts will change the way you view history and understand what's going on in the world today. So something I want to focus on, and the thing that really caught my attention, is the strategy both Roth and Michael had used. One so powerful, yet requires the utmost delicacy to have executed correctly. One that's been the consistent cause in the rise of some and the destruction of others. It's been used against everyone from kings and empires to friends and family members. No matter the century or time period, this is one of the most important and deadly stratagems that have ever been used in the entire history of the game of power. The classic Divide et Impera, Divide and Conquer. A lot of you have been asking for this one, so sit back, relax, and let's get into it. Born in Palermo, Sicily, Frank Pentangeli, also known as Frankie Five Angels, was a longtime Corleone family member and served under Capo Peter Clemenza as one of his top soldiers. Why was he called Frankie Five Angels? Well, it stems from his last name, Pentangeli. Pente means five in Greek, and you guessed it, the word angeli means angels in Italian. Frankie began his criminal career from quite early on. There were a few families scattered across the city, however, the real power was held by two major families, the most powerful being led by Don Giuseppe Mariposa and the close second, Rosario Lacanti. Frank rose through the ranks under mob Don Giuseppe Mariposa. Don Mariposa had controlled the streets of New York for some time. He was feared primarily due to the capable capos he had under him, which included the Barzini brothers, Tomasino Cinquamani, and even the Rosado brothers. Frankie was revered in the streets of New York, building a solid reputation as a capable enforcer. By 1933, and Prohibition had just ended, as well as Mariposa's rise as the most powerful Don in the city, following his taking out the most second powerful family and his long-term rival, he now felt unstoppable and so wanted to consolidate his power once and for all. Although not the most powerful of the New York Dons, Vito was on his way up. Prohibition made all the families rich, but the way each one of them spent this wealth was to determine where they would stand in this new era. But you see, Mariposa was not going to stop there. He set up a meeting with all the powerful families in the city. Here's essentially what he said. The price of not starting a destructive war that will in fact hurt everyone involved were only a few things. A small price to avoid any unnecessary hostilities. His first demand was not too surprising coming from an egotistical man like Mariposa. Since he was the most powerful and demanded to be acknowledged as the boss of all bosses, each Don could remain the boss of his own family. However, he would hold that title and must comply with his laws. They would all work for him now. The second demand was perhaps equally as disrespectful. Since he had a, quote, small beak, Mariposa demanded 15% of all their operations. Upon hearing this, the Dons looked to each other around the table, watching for each other's reactions, but not a single one of them gave away a thing. Vito knew the other Dons didn't like what they heard, but went along since it was a better alternative than a prolonged war. But it gets a lot deeper. But for now, they were going to comply.
In a small restaurant on the east side of New York, Pete and Jenko had just received their order, when seemingly out of nowhere, the restaurant's large, heavy door opened. Two men in trench coats and fedoras entered the restaurant. They greeted Pete and started to pull out their guns, but before they pulled them, they were both frozen at the absolutely terrifying sight of the beast Luca Brazzi, who had just come out of the kitchen. Although unarmed, he made everyone stop in their tracks. The sound of two gunshots broke the silence. It seemed that someone had taken out their driver. It was time to get this over with, but before they could fully take out their weapons, four men on a nearby table had already drawn their weapons. And, well, you know what happened next. Clemenza nonchalantly then took a sip from his wine glass and then gave orders for his men to begin cleaning up. But as they began to clean up, someone else emerged. Frankie Pentangeli also walked out from the kitchen and then joined Clemenza and Jenko. Now, I'm sure you're a bit confused about what just happened. Let's take a step back and understand how we got here. Mariposa never wanted or expected Vito to accept the terms he set out. He needed a valid excuse to take out Vito. He would need to move quickly to ensure Vito would not see him coming or start scheming his way out of this trap. But since that attempt failed, he needed a new strategy. And soon, he found it. His plan was quite simple. Take out Vito's top men to cripple him. Then he would be forced to come back with his tail between his legs, in which Mariposa would then take him out himself. To do this, he did the following. Instead of sending his own men to get the job done, he brought in two outsiders, having had his spies track down the places Pete and Jenko would frequent, to then take them out there. But what Mariposa didn't realize is that they were actually three steps ahead the whole time. You see, two of Mariposa's men had secretly been reporting to the Corleone family, specifically one of his capos, Frank Pentangeli. Frankie had warned the Corleones just in time that they were ready. He decided that it would be in everyone's interest to see new leadership over the criminal underworld, and so secretly began siding with this up-and-coming Don called Vito Corleone. And so, after swearing his allegiance to the Corleone family, Frank would continuously report to Clemenza on what Mariposa was up to, giving the Corleone family an edge in this battle. Although this attack was foiled and went by smoothly for the Corleones, this was officially a declaration of war. Now, the Olive Oil War itself has its own set of intriguing events that we've discussed in the past. You can watch it after this. As we already know, Vito had come out as the victor, and so began the beginning of a new era, the era of the Corleone dynasty. Vito was now the one who held all the strings. Frankie played an instrumental role in this victory, and so his loyalty was rewarded. Frank would be one of the best and effective enforcers in the Corleone family. He was Clemenza's top soldier and became his right-hand man. He was respected for his skills and loyalty. He served the Corleone family for many years, which was why when Clemenza died from a supposed heart attack, Michael put Frankie in charge of Clemenza's regime, as well as heading the entire Corleone operations in New York. Although often rash and aggressive, Frankie was very well liked by all. He shared Vito's principles and values, which is something important to keep in mind, because as you know, later on he would be challenged on whether he would continue to hold on to these principles or betray everything he stood for. Now, we're all caught up, let's get straight into it. There's something, a secret hidden deep within the film that most people have never realized. Listen closely, you and I know by now the reason behind Roth's vendetta against Michael, although Roth tries to hide it. Once his cards are all laid out, Michael realizes that Roth had been choreographing this masterful scheme since the day he received word what happened to his friend. You can see it all coming together in Michael's head in this very scene, but what I wanna focus on and the thing that Really caught my attention is the strategy he used, one so powerful yet requires the utmost delicacy to have executed correctly, one that's been the consistent cause in the rise and some of the destruction of others. It's been used against everyone from kings and empires to friends and family members. No matter the century or time period, this is one of the most important and deadly stratagems that have ever been used in the entire history of the game of power. The classic Divide et Impera, Divide and Conquer. When you look at your enemies, don't be intimidated by their appearance. Instead, look at the parts that make up the whole. 
By separating the parts, sowing dissension and division from within, you can weaken and bring down even the most formidable foe. In setting up your attack, work on their minds to create internal conflict. Look for the joints and links, the things that connect the people in a group or connect one group to another. Division is weakness, and the joints are the weakest part of any structure. When you're facing troubles or enemies, turn a large problem into small, eminently defeatable parts. This is one of the most important and deadly stratagems that have ever been used in the entire history of the game of power. We'll be dedicating an entire video on this topic and how it's utilized, not just in The Godfather, but in some critical moments in history. As well as some, well, I'm gonna stop there. I don't wanna spoil it for you, but anyway, stay tuned for that. Now, let's briefly break down how Roth specifically used this. The reason I read you that small segment is the fact it perfectly describes what Roth and Barzini before him were contemplating. Pay close attention to the highlighted sections. Roth was up against someone who at the time, on paper, was more powerful. Michael was the godfather and had far more manpower, so direct confrontation was not an option. However, Roth was a veteran of the criminal underworld. He had seen so many powerful men come and go, and somehow managed to survive. But Roth noticed some very weak links in the Corleone body, and this is where the Rosado brothers come in. Carmine and Tony Rosado were a duo entrenched in the world of organized crime. They led their own faction within the Corleone crime family. Their close ties were with Peter Clemenza, who took charge of the Corleone operations in New York after he moved to Nevada. Aligned with Hyman Roth, who supported their endeavors, the Rosado brothers were integral figures in this intricate web of power. There were rumors that Clemenza promised them some territories in the Bronx, though Pantangeli claims Clemenza promised them... promised them Ugatus, as he hated them just as much as Frank did. The intricate dynamics of loyalty and rivalry within the family played out against the backdrop of shifting alliances and territorial ambitions. And so, this is how Roth played it. He began organizing a deal that he knew would hypnotize Michael. Knowing this, he would more aggressively fund and back the Rosado brothers' claims on those territories, which would cause a serious conflict between Frankie and the Rosados, in which could spill into an all-out destructive war, something Michael would not allow, thereby creating a lot of tension between Michael and Frankie. From Frankie's point of view, there was no reason for Michael to be doing this. Why would he let these people savagely turn their streets from clean, safe, and organized to indiscriminate chaos? And there's no mistake, Michael knew this was going on. Even the fact that they were being backed by Roth, his reasoning here is quite clear. He either didn't care enough to give it more attention, especially with all the big plans he had going on. It seems that all these street matters were no longer something he wanted to to have any involvement with. To Frankie, Michael was turning his back, not just on himself, but betraying all those who were loyal to his father, the Don. So what does that mean? It means Roth's plot began years prior to the attack on the Corleone family. As we know, after Frank was ambushed by the Rosado brothers, they actually framed Michael as the culprit behind this attack by saying, Michael Corleone he says hello. This instilled the idea into Frank's mind that he was betrayed by Michael. So now you can imagine what was going through Pentangeli's mind and had felt thinking that he was the one betrayed by Michael. Also, it's important to note that at this time, Michael didn't know Frankie was still alive when he got back from Cuba, which would have grave consequences later on. And this brings us back to the most vital point, the crescendo of Roth's impeccable plot. After surviving Roth's plot in Cuba, Michael returned to the U.S. and was to face a new set of seemingly impossible challenges and threats to the empire. At this time, the U.S. Senate was investigating the growing influence and power of the Mafia in the U.S. The committee was popularly known as the Kefauver Committee, and since Michael was the most powerful figure in the criminal underworld, he was the center of this investigation. They were also digging into Michael's past, namely into his involvement in taking out police Captain McCluskey and Virgil Solozzo, but also revisiting the rumors of his father being known as the Godfather. Michael knew all this and had planned to use it to remove these accusations. Michael wanted to outsmart the Senate and use its publicity as a PR stunt to rectify his family's image, which is why, instead of invoking his Fifth Amendment right, defying the advice of his consigliere, why was this risky? Well, if Michael was found to have lied in any way to the committee, he would face some extremely serious perjury charges, as well as ruining his image as well as the Corleone 
own name forever. But Michael had become quite arrogant, which blinded his judgment. The Fifth Amendment would mean that Michael could legally avoid answering certain questions during the hearing that would incriminate him. But Michael saw this as a sign that would lead the public to think he had something to hide. And so, ignoring his consigliere and lawyer's advice, Michael confidently dismissed all the allegations, which if proven, would send Michael to jail and destroy the Corleone Empire. So, he very openly and publicly lied to the government. Michael knew this was a risk, but even so, he felt he had held all the cards to his favor. He owned a senator within that committee. His biggest enemy at the time, Roth, was in hiding after the whole Cuba incident, not to mention he was in extremely poor health. Also, at this time, the only witnesses the committee had was Willie Chichi, who confessed Michael was the boss, but couldn't prove any illegal or criminal activity that Michael was directly involved in. Thanks to the structure of Cosa Nostra, there's always a buffer between the boss and his soldiers. So, Michael saw no serious threat. As well as Michael himself having an impeccable record, serving in the military during World War II, he was a war hero, plus the fact that he was never arrested and being involved in various other charitable and political activities were all factors Michael thought would play in his favor. Now, as we all know, what happened next? completely struck Michael by surprise. After surviving the Rosado brothers' trap, Frankie miraculously survived. Even though very reluctant to do so, he breaks his oath of omerta and agrees to also testify against Michael. This is perhaps the best and most brilliant play against the Corleone family we ever got to see. Roth knew Michael was due to testify and had placed this as a contingency plan. And so, since Michael didn't plead the fifth and lied to the committee, he opened himself to five counts of perjury. So basically, if Frankie testifies, it literally means the end of the Corleone dynasty. This is the biggest and most difficult challenge Michael has ever faced. This was Roth's last stand, his final masterpiece. This was so well laid out, it would be impossible to escape this one. What Michael does next shocks everyone. Now, it was clear Michael needed to silence Frank once and for all. Problem is, he was being held in a high-security army base with 24-hour guards, and even if he miraculously managed to get to Pentangeli, he would be the biggest suspect if anything were to happen to him. So he needs to somehow either not allow Frank to reach the courtroom, or preferably somehow get Frank to change his testimony. But the question is, how is he going to be able to do this in such a short amount of time? Well, Michael made him an offer he can't refuse. For the people who might be confused as to who this man is. This is Don Vincenzo Pentangeli, Frank Pentangeli's older brother. He lived in Sicily his whole life as the local Don, a true mafioso, strictly abiding by the Code of Omerta. So when he saw his brother publicly breaking the Code of Omerta and dishonoring his family, Vincenzo could not believe his eyes. And as soon as Frank saw his brother, he too was in disbelief. When he saw his brother publicly breaking the Code of Omerta and dishonoring his family, Vincenzo was in shock shock with what he just saw. Frankie knew he had to rethink exactly what he was doing and do it fast, as there's no time to spare, as his decision will not only seal his fate, but his family's and the entire criminal underworld. Pentangeli was either going to break the law of the government or the law of the mafia, and what he did next would determine the victor of this war. people should either be caressed or crushed. If you do them minor damage, they will get their revenge. But if you cripple them, there is nothing they can do. Frankie broke the code of Omerta, similar to why Michael needed to take out Fredo as the godfather of the mob he needed to set an example. He couldn't allow his men to think that they could get away with such indiscretions. Also, while he's still alive, there's always the possibility of having this issue resurface. Who knows, with a little bit of pressure and a better deal, Frankie might end up singing. So Frankie had to go, and since he was untouchable from the outside, it would have to come from the inside. He then just sent Tom to meet with Frankie. When Tom meets with Frankie, they meet as two old friends would, two veterans of a bygone era reminiscing of a once glorious past. Nothing is spelled out, everything is conveyed through implication, two individuals well aware of the unfolding events. A handshake solidifies the pact. You stake your life in exchange for your family's safety and security, keeping in mind that they were being closely watched, but nonetheless. Now, this scene is simply phenomenal, probably my favorite from the trilogy. There are so many layers of meaning, so much going on that we spend an entire video just discussing this one scene. But let's break down what you need to know. 
And we was like the Roman Empire. The Corleone family was like the Roman Empire. The period that they were referring to, the golden era of the family, was the years that followed the Olive Oil War. This was when Don Vito had officially consolidated his power and was recognized as the most powerful mafia don in the country and one of the most powerful men in New York. Here, Tom is laying it all out for Frankie and instantly follows along. On a plot against the Emperor failed. Plotters were always given a chance. Let the families keep their fortunes. This is the negotiation, or rather the terms for Frankie's capitulation to his fate. It was an offer he could not refuse. The emperors, unless they went home and they themselves, and nothing happened. And the families, their families were taken care of, Tom. With this reply, Tom is relieved that That's Frankie not only got the message loud and clear, but he knew what he had to do. Even though he wasn't completely off the hook, this was the best, realistic exit Frankie would have wished for. Hagen says to the brother, who speaks only Sicilian, which means the family's honor is intact. We've discussed why Michael had to, or rather thought he needed to take out Fredo, so I want to break down the concept of crushing your enemies. Although they're similar in many ways, from a strategic point of view, they differ quite a lot. Let's quickly understand what Machiavelli meant when he said this. For it must be noted that men must either be caressed or else crushed. They will revenge themselves for small injuries, but cannot do so for great ones. The injury, therefore, that we do to a man must be such that we need not fear his vengeance. Makes sense how he built the reputation and infamy he has, right? But let's keep in mind who Machiavelli was talking to, as well as the society and era he was in. To keep it brief, let's have Machiavelli let us know who he was talking to. To the magnificent Lorenzo de' Medici. It is customary most of the time for those who desire to acquire favor with a prince to come to meet him with things that they care most for among their own or with things that they see please him most. Thus, since I desire to offer myself to your magnificence, I have found nothing in my belongings that I care so much for and esteem so greatly as the knowledge of the actions of great men, learned by me from long experience with modern things and a continuous reading of ancient ones. Having thought out and examined these things with great diligence for a long time, and now reduce them to one small volume, I send it to your magnificence. And although I judge this work undeserving of your presence, yet I have much confidence that through your humanity it may be accepted, considering that no greater gift could be made by me than to give you the capacity to be able to understand in a very short time all that I have learned. So Machiavelli was writing his infamous work, not for some random or your average Joe, not at all. It was for one of the most powerful and influential men in Italian history, at a time where treachery was well in its height across Europe, and as Niccolo himself accurately confesses, he was a true master of understanding human nature and psychology, but more specifically, the psychology of the top players in the game of power. As you already probably know, The Prince was a required reading for any mob boss and even the most intelligent mafia and if we were to imagine that a highly educated guy like Michael Corleone was real, speaking strictly from his actions, Machiavelli would approve. With all that in mind, let's break down his thought process. In the Mafia, there's no escaping, openly breaking Omerta. It put the entirety of the Mafia in danger. If it wasn't Michael, other families would have done it themselves, which would reflect very badly. But looking at his track record, it's not like Michael was the type to forgive betrayal. Another factor Michael needed to consider, even if he was willing to let it slide, since in the end it all worked out, is actually the fact that it doesn't truly end. Who knows, maybe a few months from now and with a bit of pressure, Frankie could come back around and give them more information that could dismantle the entirety of the American Mafia. The risk was too great, too many powerful people were in serious danger. The threat had to be neutralized or else. It was also the perfect opportunity to make an example of him. Look, all this chaos weakened Michael and his status as Godfather. In that ruthless world, any sign of weakness could and will be used against him. Like vultures, those around him are desperate for any hints of openings to strike. Just ask his father. Knowing all this, and with Machiavelli's advice in mind, Michael would continue to do and follow what so many in positions of power have done. Crush. 
crush the enemy with no remorse. And by the way, Machiavelli was not alone in this. Crush the enemy is a key strategic tenant of Sun Tzu, the 4th century BC author of The Art of War. The idea is simple. Your enemies wish you will. There is nothing they want more than to eliminate you. If, in your struggles with them, you stop halfway or even three-quarters of the way, out of mercy or hope of reconciliation, you only make them more determined, more embittered, and they will someday take revenge. They may act friendly for the time being, but this is only because you have defeated them. They have no choice but to bide their time. The solution? Have no mercy. Crush your enemies as totally as they would crush you. Ultimately, the only peace and security you can hope for from your enemies is their disappearance. And Michael took this and went all in. But the problem is all the serious potential consequences of taking this course of action. It's not always the right move to make. As a player in the game of power, there are a lot of things you need to consider before even thinking about using this stratagem. We'll have a full in-depth breakdown of this stratagem, so once it's released, make sure to be one of the first to have watched it, as we'll have something special planned for the first viewers, so make sure you have the notification on for your chance to be one of the lucky few. So click this card on screen now and watch this video.